Hello and good morning. I hope that you're all well. Thank you for joining Mrs Parkman's Academy of Needlework for a presentation entitled Rich Girl, Poor Girl. It's always a privilege for me to talk with other like-minded people about needlework and in particular samplers. It's such a treat for me. I thought it would be far nicer to record this talk as an informal floss tube rather than a more formal presentation. I have pre-recorded the video as today I am actually in Arizona rather than at home in Cornwall. I'm giving a series of lectures at the Attic Needleworks 2024 Sampler Symposium. I thought by releasing this video at the same time that no matter where you live in the world, you could attend one of my talks. Are we sitting comfortably? Well, let us begin. Today's talk was originally presented at the Attic Needleworks Sampler Symposium in 2023. Today, we are going to explore two very different samplers from the early years of the Victorian era. The two samplers are tangible and palpable links to the girls' lives and stories. With these samplers, the girls have stitched their names into history, ensuring their memory lives on. Their schoolgirl samplers are the only reason that we remember them today. The samplers were both worked in the northern county of Yorkshire by Anne and Sarah when they were young girls. The two girls were born in the Victorian era within 12 years of each other, but their samplers, lives, living conditions, lifespan, education and culture were a world apart. Now, the Victorian era in England was an extensive period of prosperity and peace. However, it was also a period of extreme social inequality. Class is a complex term and the Victorians liked to have their social classes clearly defined and it was difficult to break through class barriers. Victorian society was multi-layered. It comprised of the monarch, and the royal family, the upper classes, the upper middle classes, the lower middle classes, the working class, and the lowest of the low, the underclass. The upper classes included dukes, earls, and baronets. These people did not work. Their income would have been derived from investments and from inherited lands. The upper middle classes were made up of people such as bankers, doctors, lawyers and clergymen. The lower middle classes were civil servants, shopkeepers and merchants. The working class were labourers, both skilled and unskilled. The underclass were the destitute, such as orphans and the unemployed who relied on charity to survive. Now, one of our sampler makers was born in the upper middle classes and had a life of privilege and wealth. She was cared for by servants. The other sampler maker was the daughter of an unskilled agricultural labourer and had a life of hard work. The two girls' worlds were polar opposites, yet the one thing these two girls had in common was needlework. Both girls stitched samplers as children. Can we tell from looking at their samplers which class the girls came from? Were they a rich girl or a poor girl? Which girl stitched which sampler? What do you think? It might help you decide if we consider the times in which the girls lived. Until more recent times, needlework was both a task and a diversion for women and young girls from around the world. It was considered essential for every female, no matter her class, to be proficient with her needle. It's hard for us today to realise the importance of sewing to a household. Some women needed to sew to exist. Working class women needed to be able to sew, not only to make and repair clothes for themselves and their families, but in many cases to earn a living. 
working class women and with children and other relatives to care for could work at home sewing ready-made clothing. Regardless of the family's financial standing, a thorough acquaintance with plain sewing was necessary. And even ladies from affluent families worked with their needles, undertaking household sewing. It may have been the only work they undertook. Now, while there was a practical aspect to sewing, fancy work was a skill that middle and upper class Victorian women were expected to have mastered by the time they married. It was a required accomplishment of a lady to embroider. Embroidery allowed women to add colourful decorations to pillows and linens, and even their clothing. Downtime was quite rare for working class Victorian women, so being able to afford time to embroider these intricate creations onto clothing or other textiles was a signifier of wealth and prosperity. It sounds wonderful having lots of time to stitch. However, many ladies from the affluent classes were starved of intellectual stimulus. Some found solace in their needle. They embroidered to pass the leisure hours and immerse themselves in creative pastimes. Through her needlework, a lady had an outlet for her creativity and could display her needlework skills in her home with pride. The Victorian lady was the original craft queen. Needlework in all its forms was seen by the Victorians as an essential component of female virtue. It was associated with domestic bliss and maternal devotion. No matter her class, marriage was the goal of every young girl and mothers prepared their daughters for marriage. Needlework was considered one of the necessary accomplishments to attract a husband. Needlework demonstrated beauty, creativity, femininity, Christian charity, social engagement and intellectual ability. Now, in the Victorian era, women's lives were controlled by convention, religion and their male relatives, husbands, brothers, fathers, uncles. Women were barred from the professions, the universities, the government and the church. A lady could not undertake work for money. A lady had to maintain her leisured lifestyle. In the time that these two samplers were stitched, the restrictions placed by society on ladies was particularly harsh for spinsters and distressed gentlewomen. Spinsters and widows could find themselves in the position of having to support themselves. Millinery and dressmaking constituted the higher end of female employment with the needle. They were respectable occupations for women from the middle classes. Needlework and teaching were also seen as acceptable. While only some women had the education to be a governess, virtually all women had the necessary experience to teach needlework. As well as employment opportunities, sewing provided women with a chance to take some ownership of their lives. A neatly worked sampler was evidence of a female's proficiency with a needle and acted as a resume a curriculum vitae when seeking employment that involved needlework skills. No matter which class a girl belonged to, they were prepared for sewing both at home and in schools. For poorer girls, sewing was taught at various working class day schools, often at the expense of skills such as writing and arithmetic. Because of the limits of her gender, a girl received a very different education from that available to a boy. Samplers were a practical needlework exercise and came to define a, a girl's childhood, charting and symbolising her progress towards womanhood. Girls usually completed at least two samplers. They started to learn needlework from the ages of four or five, often beginning with a marking sampler a primer. Marking samplers served a dual purpose. They taught a child basic embroidery techniques and the alphabet and numbers. 
The letters and numbers learnt while embroidering a marking sampler were especially useful since it was important that a wife was able to keep track of her linens. This was accomplished by marking them, usually in cross stitch, with her initials and number. For those who were fortunate enough to stay in school, a second, more decorative sampler followed. Verses were often incorporated and demonstrated the child's prudence and virtue. The sampler stitched by Anne and Sarah are in two very different styles. Does the style of needlework reveal if the girls were rich or poor? Let's explore the girls' samplers for clues. The sampler that Sarah stitched when she was 12 years of age in 1834 is most certainly decorative. It's a bobby dazzler of a sampler. Sarah had access to an extensive palette of vibrant colours. The young girl showed great diligence in working the intricate border and cartouche surrounding her name. We were strongly drawn to Sarah's sampler the moment we glimpsed her in an auction catalogue. That red house that takes centre stage is magnificent. The geometric motifs flanking the verse are another focal point of interest. Although we have seen these on other samplers, they are not commonplace. Sarah showed great industry with her needle and filled her sampler with many beautiful motifs. She would have been hard pressed to squeeze another motif in. She must have spent considerable hours choosing her verse and working out the placement of the motifs and border. In planning her sampler, she would have learned basic mathematics. Her sampler's layout shows that she had a good understanding of arithmetic. I think she has shown great all-round aptitude. The sampler would have taken some time to stitch. Sarah deserves to be applauded for her achievement. She would have made her needlework teacher and parents proud. But what of Anne's sampler? Can this sampler be attributed to a particular school or religion? When I first saw this sampler, I wondered if it might be a Quaker sampler. There are several similar samplers featured in Carol Humphrey's book on Quaker schoolgirl samplers from Ackworth, Yorkshire. One would be forgiven for thinking that Anne's sampler was stitched by a Quaker child. However, from our research, we have found that Anne was raised in the Anglican faith. She was one of seven children born to Joseph Campion and his wife, Eleanor. Her sampler records that it was stitched in Whitby. Anne's sampler was worked on a small piece of linen with a limited palette. It was stitched primarily in black with the only hints of colour being tiny dabs of cream and pink on the two dogs and around the bird's eyes. It's a simple marking sampler, yet it has an elegance. Its beauty shines. The sampler clearly demonstrates that this girl could mark linen and stitch neatly. Have you noticed in Anne's sampler that after the alphabet, she has stitched some punctuation marks? The one mark that puzzled me was the C after the ampersand. Do you know what this is an abbreviation of? I did not, but my husband did. An ampersand followed by a C is an abbreviation for the Latin word etc. Is this a clue as to the quality of education that Anne was receiving? Have you come to a firm decision as to which girl was rich and which was poor? Before I reveal which is which, let us have a look at the girls' lives. One of these two girls was born into wealth, the other born into poverty. One of these girls married a bricklayer, the other married a notable surgeon. His family were prosperous and they were influential members of society she married a social equal. One girl would have received an education paid for by her wealthy father. She would have been taught either at home by a governess or at a private day or boarding school. 
The other girls' education would have been limited as the children of agricultural labourers were needed to work rather than attend school. The girl probably worked for sampler in a charity school or a Sunday school. Now, Victorian Sunday schools were very different to Sunday schools of today. They were set up to provide lessons in reading, writing and arithmetic, as well as religious education. And these lessons were very basic. At the time when many children worked to support their families, Sunday school provided for some the only opportunity for education. We know that both girls could neatly stitch out the alphabet and her name. However, this did not mean that she could read or write. From her marriage record, we know that one girl was unable to write as she marked her name in the parish record with a cross. We know from our research that one girl was a paragon of virtue and led a respectful life. The other girl was the opposite. Three months after her marriage, a curious notice appeared in a newspaper. This is to give notice that I, Thomas Ward Branham of Beale in the parish of Callington in the county of York will not be answerable for any debt or debts that my wife may contract after this notice. I wonder what happened in those three months that caused Thomas to place such a notice in a newspaper. In the 19th century, marriage and motherhood were indivisible. Motherhood was considered an upper-class woman's only correct occupation. It was a service to their husbands. Wealthy families wanted children for heirs and poor families wanted children for workers. Whether married to a king or a humble labourer, women endured unavoidable and frequent pregnancies. Some were in a constant state of pregnancy. It was very common for women to die in childbirth. The risk of death was real for women, no matter their class. One of these girls had six children over the course of nine years. A search of family history records has uncovered no children being born to the other girl. One of our girls was widowed young. The other girl left her husband, which was scandalous. From family history records, we suspect that she went on to either commit bigamy or lived in sin with another man. She was quite a girl for the times. One of these girls worked as a servant, whilst the other employed servants. Anne and Sarah most certainly lived very different lives, but they both stitched samplers as young girls. Some things to consider about the samplers. Were the samplers the first or second samplers the girl stitched? At what age would a girl have been expected to stitch her first sampler? Both girls were around 11 and 12 years of age when they stitched their samplers. Was 12 late for stitching a marking sampler? Does this indicate that Anne received little education? Which girl received the better education? Can we tell from their samplers? Poor girls whose future was servitude needed to be adept in plain sewing and mending. Would they have been taught decorative needlework? Was it likely to feature in domestic work? Have you changed your mind throughout the course of this talk as which sampler was stitched by the rich girl? Samplers never cease to amaze me. Never take anything at face value. Always research the backstory. Every sampler has a story to tell and appearances can be deceptive. A natural assumption would be that Anne was the poor girl, but she was the rich girl. I wonder where Sarah found time to work such a bobby dazzler of a sampler. As she was unable to write, to even sign her name, we know that she had a limited education. Here is her marriage certificate. Note the X rather than a signature. 
On a side note, here is the notice that Thomas placed in the newspaper. Why was Anne stitching a basic sampler at age 12 rather than a more advanced project? From research carried out since, I originally gave this talk in the January of 2023. I think I know why, but that subject will be a talk for another day. I would love to go back in time and find out more about these girls. There is further personal information in their books for you to enjoy. It casts more light onto their lives. What have I taken from these two samplers? I think that these two samplers show that needlework is a great leveller. It did not matter which class the girls were from when it came to the samplers they stitched. Just as it is for us today, it was really up to the child if they apply themselves to learn and to spend time with their needle. Learning and pushing ourselves out of our comfort zone will bring rewards for us and our needles. The one accomplishment that Sarah and Anne both had in common was needlework. It is our shared accomplishment too. It is needlework that has brought us all together today. Before I finish this talk, I would like to highlight some stitching points about the two samplers. On Sarah's sampler, she added tips to the fruit on the tree to the left of the house. You might like to add them to the tree on the right to balance the sampler. On Sarah's sampler, there is an anomaly in the way she stitched this particular U and O in the verse. On Anne's sampler, note the bird on the left has longer legs than the bird on the right. The final motif on Anne's sampler has a counting anomaly. I know that many of you have been waiting a long time for Sarah and Anne's samplers to be released. I am delighted to announce that they are both now available for you to purchase. On the Hands Across the Sea Samplers website, you will find both the printed books and the PDF downloads available. The printed books are also available from needlework stores around the world. The models for both samplers were lovingly stitched by the contented stitcher, and I know that she had much pleasure from stitching the samplers. I hope that both samplers will bring you countless hours of joy, both in stitching them and when they hang on your sampler wall. I hope that today you have learnt a little bit about samplers and enjoyed the first talk from Mrs Parkman's Academy of Needlework. I also hope that you will participate in the next event. It will be an online workshop and will release in the next week or so. Thank you for joining me.